Hi guys, it's Jess and welcome back to my channel and a very happy new year. Today I am going to be talking about my favourite books from 2017 and in order to do this I just went onto my Goodreads list and I looked at books that I had rated between 4 and 5 stars and then I thought about the books that have stuck with me because I think that when you read a book your initial reaction can change with a couple of weeks or months reflection so there were some books that I read and I either refused to rate because I didn't know how I felt about them or I gave them a lower rating and then after a short period of reflection I realised that actually the book had stuck with me and had made a real impact on me and um, so I altered my rating or I felt better about that book and I also went for books that I would automatically recommend to someone if someone said to me what should I read these are the books that I would immediately pull off my shelf and give to them so there are a couple of different reasons why I loved the books uh, but yeah let's just jump straight in I have to apologise if I sound a little bit croaky as well today. I'm filming this on New Year's Day and I was out last night for New Year's Eve and um, I was doing a lot of talking and shouting and being excitable and having a few drinks um, and my throat is paying the price for it today so I apologise for that. Um, these books are in no particular order so yeah let's just start with the first one. So first up I have Between Shades of Grey by Ruta Sepetys. This is a book set during the Second World War. It's about a young Lithuanian girl whose family is forced to leave their home by the Soviets and they are packed onto a train with thousands of other Eastern Europeans and sent into the far reaches of Siberia and into awful um, camps um, and living circumstances and forced to try and scrape an existence and to work for the Soviets. And the reason that I love this book so much, I mean it's an incredibly haunting and hard-hitting and bleak story, but the reason that I really enjoyed reading this book is because it's about a segment of the Second World War that I'd not really come across before. Obviously Russia's involvement in the Second World War is a really well-known factor, um, but I'd never really read anything about the remaining smaller Eastern European countries, and so it was a really eye-opening read as well, particularly because this book is based on um, a series of real-life accounts as well. And I don't know if this is a spoiler, but if you haven't read this book and you want to, then uh, maybe skip forward and come back when the book isn't on the screen anymore. But one of the things that particularly stuck out to me is the fact that even once the war was finished and the survivors of the camps were allowed to go back to their home countries um, because of Russia's secret police. Um, they weren't allowed to talk about their experiences, like they were banned from talking about them, they were banned from like sharing their stories even with each other, never mind with the rest of the world. And it really struck me how on earth you would process what you'd been through if you weren't even allowed to talk to somebody about what had happened to you and I don't know whether they even wanted to talk about what had happened to them but for me personally in order to process such a harrowing set of circumstances I would want to say this had happened to me and so everything was really secretive and even the surviving accounts that the author um, pulled from you know they had to be written and hidden away because they literally weren't allowed to discuss what had happened and what Russia had done to them and I just thought that that was so horrendous um, and yeah it just really really stuck out to me and this is a book that I recommend to countless people particularly those who enjoy um, how many times can I say particularly um, especially to those who enjoy uh, Second World War stories because um, yeah I get I just as I said I didn't know about this particular part of the Second World War um, and I just found it a really eye-opening book Next up we have The Shadow of the Wind by Carlos Ruiz Zafon and this is a much loved and much talked about book on booktube and um, the only thing that I have to say is that I don't know why it took me so long to pick it up because various booktubers that I love have been talking about this book for years and it's just taken me so long to pick it up but having said that this was not 
the type of book that I was expecting it to be based on the way that people describe it. It's often talked about as a book for book lovers and I don't know, something about the way that it was described put me in mind of something quite different from how it was. So it was a nice surprise I guess to actually pick it up and read it and realise that this is actually a historical fiction. It's set um, after the conclusion of the Spanish Civil War in Barcelona and it's a mystery book. So basically a young boy is taken by his father to a place called the Cemetery of Forgotten Books and he is told that he can pick one book but he has to then guard that book with his life. And from that point, his entire series of events unfold regarding the origins of that book, the author of that that book and a whole mystery about um, who wrote the book and what happened to him and what happened to his other written works and it's not a fast paced book but there's a fair amount of action, it's got great character development, it is definitely a book that will appeal to book lovers um, but it's also a book that will appeal to people who enjoy historical fiction and to people who enjoy a good old fashioned mystery as well so yeah another one that I would definitely recommend. Then we have Wonder by RJ Palaccio, this is a middle grade book which I think most people will know about because the film version of this book was released in 2017. It's basically about a young boy called August who has a facial deformity and up until the start of this book August has been homeschooled by his parents in order to protect him from um, the opinions and glances of people in the outside world but when this book begins his parents have decided that he needs to join a mainstream school and we follow various different perspectives. We follow August as he comes to terms with what this will mean for his life as he knows it. We follow, um, I think we follow the perspective of one of August's friends that he makes and then also um, a bully who makes August's life quite difficult in the initial months that he begins at school. Um, this is just such a lovely, heartwarming story that just gives you all the feels. It's super short, it's super easy to read. I think I finished it in a day. Um, you just get completely wrapped up in August. He's just so incredible as a little boy with a facial deformity who has to overcome all these kind of difficulties and assumptions about him and he just gets on with it in such a lovely way yet at the same time it's incredibly brutal in the way that it brings to the forefront the fact that people make so many assumptions about other people based on their physical appearances and how wrong that is um, and I think it's a great book even though it's middle grade so it's aimed at children I think that it's a great book for adults to read and I haven't watched the movie yet but I'm very very excited to do so because if it's anything like this book then I just think it's going to be fantastic. Next up we have Burial Rites by Hannah Kent and this is a historical fiction novel and it's about the last woman to be executed in Iceland so it's based on a series of real events but it's a fictionalized version of what might have happened. So it takes place during 1829 and Agnes is basically sent to stay with a prominent family in a village while she's awaiting a date for her execution and I think she chooses um, a priest from another village whose job it is to come and kind of absolve her of her guilty conscience prior to her execution. So all of these characters and the setting is entirely accurate but um, Hannah Kent has fictionalised the story but it's an incredibly heartbreaking and hard hitting story. The way that Hannah Kent explores perhaps some of the reasons behind um, Agnes's decision and the situation that she found herself in and if even a smidgen of it is true it's also an incredibly unfair set of circumstances and one of the things that I found particularly interesting was the fact that Hannah Kent has um, copied real documents at the beginning of each chapter and they talk about all kinds of stuff from the price of the axe that's going to be used to whether Agnes has accepted responsibility for her actions and just all kinds of stuff and it's a really fascinating insight um, into stuff that actually happened. Despite being such a bleak outlook going into the story and such a bleak setting full stop. There's just something about this book that's also incredibly uplifting and heartwarming and there is a small thread of hope 
that runs through the story throughout um, and even though you know the outcome and the outcome is incredibly sad I still found myself utterly moved in the last few chapters um, despite knowing going in what was going to happen um, so yeah I just I really really enjoyed it and um, Hannah Kent has actually released another book called The Good People which is on my TBR for 2018 and again if it's anything like this then I know I'm absolutely gonna love it. Then we have Station Eleven by Emily St John Mandel and again this is a book with a very bleak setting. It's a post-apocalyptic story and we follow two timelines. Basically a deadly flu has hit the world and wiped out the majority of the world's population so we follow a timeline in the run-up to the flu hitting and then 20 years later we follow a band of musicians and actors who are traveling around the surviving settlements performing Shakespeare plays and this is similar to Burial Rites. It has an incredibly bleak setting and Emily St John Mandel's writing is incredibly bleak but there is something about the way that she draws out the story. There is just such a sense of hope and an exploration of what we need as human beings in order to survive, in order to have a sense of fulfillment from our lives. And do we draw that from um, wealth? Do we draw that from prestige? Do we draw that from having big houses, lots of electronics? Or do we draw it from simple things like the beauty in the world around us, from reading a good book, from watching um, an exciting play you know all these kind of things and I just really really loved it I feel like that's not a very good description of the book the book is a lot better than I have made it sound it's bleak and yet it's full of hope and um yeah it's just a really good in-depth look I'm just basically saying the same things it's a really good in-depth look at what makes humans humans and what we need from life and I loved it and I pushed this book on everybody so I'm pushing it on you watcher as well um yeah it's very very good. Next up we have Mad Ship or The Mad Ship by Robin Hobb. This is the second book in a trilogy called The Live Ship Traders and if you've watched any of my other book videos you will know that I am a huge Robin Hobb fan. I think she is a really underrated fantasy author. I bang on about her all the time to anybody who even indicates slightly that they might like fantasy books um, but she is a master of the character development. Her books don't tend to have a lot of action although The Live Ship Traders has more action in it than some of her other trilogies but she's all about the complex character development and the complex overarching storyline and so this series of books I read the first one and the second one in 2017 this series of books basically follows um, a whole tangle of characters it has a magical system it's based around the concept of wooden boats that are built from a wood called wizard wood and after three consecutive generations of the family who own the boat die on deck that ship comes to life um it sounds a bit far-fetched but again there's just something about Robin Hobbs writing that will really really draw you in. I mean these books are not small, each book is over 800 pages long but you really don't notice the length of them once you get caught up in the story. There are pirates, there is magic, there is treachery, betrayal, there is love, there is just absolutely everything that you can imagine going on in these books and I am so excited to read the third one this year. One of my goals this year, which I will talk about in another video, is to finish some of the series that I've been reading um, over the last couple of years and this is definitely high on my list because it's absolutely fantastic. If you like fantasy books, if you like uh, books which are character driven more than plot driven and you've never picked up a Robin Hobb book then I definitely recommend that you do this year. Next up we have Peace Like a River by Leif Enger. This is a book which is told from the perspective of 11 year old Reuben Land and Reuben's brother has been accused of murder. He's escaped from prison and he has become an outlaw and so Reuben, his father and his sister travel across the country to try and find his brother and kind of bring him back into the fold as it were. It's a heartwarming gorgeous story about family, about faith, about trust, about truth, about the many many mysteries and miracles of life. Um, I mentioned in my November wrap-up that there is a strong sense of faith in this book so it may not be for everybody but the real 
thing that stuck out to me about this book was the beautiful writing style. It, I can't put into words adequately how incredibly well written the book is, how descriptive it is and how every sentence has just been so carefully crafted and you have no doubt whatsoever um, about what the author is trying to achieve. He just conjures up so many beautiful descriptions and allegories and just absolutely everything. I just absolutely loved the writing style of this book as well as the story being incredibly heartwarming as well. So it is definitely one that I would recommend. Next we have The Thirteenth Tale by Diane Setterfield. This is a historical fiction book, it's a dual timeline book and basically our protagonist is a young girl who works with her father in a bookshop and she um, writes autobiographies not autobiographies, she writes biographies on the side and she receives a letter inviting her to go and write the biography of a very famous author who up until that point has pretty much bamboozled the press and anybody who's tried to discover anything about her life by lying or deliberately misleading people and she has refused to write a biography. So this young woman goes along to the house and from there begins to uncover a whole series of mysteries surrounding the upbringing of this author and this is just a very wonderful story. Not much happens by way of plot but again it's very strong on characters, it's very strong on character development and um, there's a lovely mystery entangled in it. It's not twisty or thrillery in any way, it's just a very simple straightforward mystery. Um, I enjoyed the dual timeline aspect, I love books like that. It kind of put me in mind of Kate Morton who is one of my all time favourite authors in the way that it had the dual timeline uh, set up and yeah I just really really enjoyed it. So before I start talking about this final book I did say that the books weren't in any particular order and it is fluke that this book ended up at the bottom of the pile and it's a book that I refused to even contemplate rating until I went back to plan out this video and I thought oh I haven't rated it yet and that just released a whole torrent of feelings about this book again and it's surprising because it's a book that I read and finished on the 2nd of January last year I think so 2017 um, and yet I still have a whole host of complex emotions about the way that this book ended but it is and I can acknowledge that it is an absolute masterpiece of writing and of course I'm talking about The Hero of Ages by Brandon Sanderson. This is the final book in his Mistborn trilogy which is a fantasy and the basic premise of the fantasy, I can't talk too much about this because it's obviously the third and final book in the trilogy but the basic premise in the first book is that we enter into a world where the bad guy won and we're a thousand years into the world where the bad guy won and the good guys were defeated and it's an exploration of what that would be like and there is a very complex magic system in which certain people are born with the ability to ingest metal and then that metal gives them various powers so it might be to enhance their hearing, to enhance their speed, their ability to take physical impacts, all that kind of thing um, and it's just such a masterpiece story. This entire trilogy has been so well thought through and planned out. There is nothing, when you get to the end of this book, um, the third book in the trilogy, there is no thread left unfinished. There is nothing that he planted in the very, very beginning of the book that does not get resolved by the end. And although the trilogy ended in a way that I didn't particularly love and that to this day, as I'm talking about this now, it still makes me like, ah, why, 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 why? But um, I have to appreciate that the way that he tied everything up, the way that he concluded the trilogy was utterly masterful and if you like fantasy and you haven't come across Mistborn and you haven't um, read it yet or if you have come across it and you haven't read it yet then I absolutely recommend that you do because even though the book did not end the way that I would have chosen it to it's still fantastic. It's still a really, really well written book and I absolutely loved it and I can't wait. You can see the rest of Brandon Sanderson's books behind me. Uh, James has read them and absolutely loved them and I can't wait to continue with his writing because he's a genius. I still am like, ah, about this book, but he is, he is undoubtedly a genius. 
So there you go, they are my top 10 favourite books of 2017. Do let me know what your favourite reads of 2017 were, whether you agree or disagree with any of my choices. Um, thank you as always for watching. If you are not yet subscribed and you would like to, please don't forget to click that all important button. Don't forget to give me the thumbs up, you know the usual spiel and I will see you all soon.